All right, so I'm going to get started now that uh, more people seem to be here. So yeah, thanks for coming, showing up early on, um, I guess this is our first morning class. And today I'm going to be talking a bit about project management. So I'm going to really quickly review the stuff from the previous class uh, as the design process ties into the project management quite a bit. So we'll be looking, whoops, looking today at moving from project design to project management. Part of that is making a really realistic schedule um, and looking at what might hamper your schedule. So I'll talk about some stuff applicable to your project, the robot project, and some just general scheduling stuff, um, such as legal issues that you might not have right now, but you will have uh, for other you know, designs you may do in the future. So the key part of the, the design method uh, is to remember there's this sort of iterative system. <coughs> Um, and you go through these different phases from idea genera generation, conceptual design, detailed design, prototyping, and to refinement and ramp up. Um, and of course, the, the key thing is too that this is not a fixed thing that you just go one, two, three, four, five, and you're done. Um, you may find yourself going back and forth a number of times. You may find yourself j going from ideas, um, and you need to test those ideas before you can really move forward further. So you may do a very basic design, and part of this conceptual design uh, will be this proof of concept we talked about. Uh, so this is where we do proof of concept prototypes. And in this stage, it might give you a better idea about is, you know, can I realistically do, achieve the goal I want with this design? It's also going to tell you a little bit about the scheduling. So, um, you know, if this works very reliably, you might say, okay, well, I can do this in a few days. If it, you know, sort of very, very vaguely works under very strict conditions, you might say, when I schedule this, uh, I know it's going to take a lot longer to do the design and we'll have to do testing and, you know, more scenarios. Um, so all of this really, in the end, will tie into the, your scheduling. And switch back here. So, if we look at project management, um, we can take, for example, a very, very simple uh, project or something we, we might want to do. Uh, so, if you were, say, you were mailing a bunch of stuff, you sold a bunch of product, you have great success, and you have to mail 500 of them. Uh, you know, this is all part of a simple project you might have. And how long would it take to mail 500? things. Uh, when you think about, you know, mailing something, you think, oh, I don't know, minute or less. Uh, so off the cuff, if you just guess completely, you might say, I don't know, like, I can do this in a day. If I really sit down and power through it, uh, I'll do this in one day and I'll be done and that'll be it. So this is totally just a made up guess and a lot of the time this is how people will try to do stuff. The problem is that when you really go to break it down, you could say, well, here's a better way to solve this issue. Um, let's look at everything I'm going to do. Even though it's a really simple task, so I've got to physically get a box, you know, unfold it somewhere. Um, that's going to take some amount of time. And we can just time ourselves, you know, taking the box, folding it up uh, into the final state. I'll have to get whatever the amazing widget I sold from, maybe I have a big table with all of them on it. Uh, grab it off the table, put it in the box. That's going to take some time. Once it's in the box, uh, we'll put padding around it, you know, so it doesn't break and people complain when they get it. Uh, we'll tape the bo box closed and finally we're going to print a label that goes in the box. So I could time myself doing each of these and say, well, you know, getting the box, folding it, maybe takes 45 seconds on average. Um, getting the widget from the store takes 15 seconds if I have a big shelf, you know, at the back of the room there. Um, and all we're going to do is add all of these, these numbers up. And Printing the postage of the labels might take the longest. So if I have to get an address out of, say, a printed customer list, um, put it into a computer, print it. It might even take longer than that. These are all you know, very rough estimates initially. So we're looking at about 4.25 minute, minutes per box. And you can multiply that through by 500. And in the end, you see, well, wow, this would take 35 hours using these estimates. Uh, so that's basically a whole week of work. And you know, this is just straight doing this without breaks added in um, or if you need to get more materials or anything like that so this is probably a much more reasonable estimate than when I just off the cuff said hey, you know 10-ish hours sounds about right and this is what project management is really all about is taking a complex 
idea or project, um, in your case, the robot design, in other systems, you know, whatever product you're tasked with designing, and figuring out how long will it take to design this, even though I've never, possibly never done this exact project before. Um, and I was, I like using Kickstarter as an example. Do people, do most people know what Kickstarter is, by the way, just as I use it? You know, you pay money to someone, basically, and they say, I promise I'm going to do this. There's no guarantee they do it. They just promise they will. Um, and one of the jokes, if you follow any of these projects, you know, they'll say that we're going to make this widget for you, a case for some computer or something, um, and we're going to ship it to you in six months, and it takes like two years every time. That's sort of how it works. And you can look through random Kickstarters if you want, and it's always, you know, like, oh, by the way, it took an extra few months uh, to have them made, and then, oh, by the way, it turns out there was um, a, I think they were on strike, the dock workers, when the shipment came in, so then there's another delay. So these are all th risks in your project, and if you have a very detailed sort of project plan, project management, you'll have as many of these risks sort of, um, taking, not taking care of, but you'll know about these risks and you'll have put some time into your schedule to deal with them. Or you'll have backup plans, you know, if this manufacturer can't pull through, we're going to uh, have it made somewhere else. Uh, in this case, it's just a delay. If you look through a lot of them, uh, there's tons of huge failures where people, you know, completely failed to estimate the cost correctly and they make millions of dollars, or they get millions of dollars and they just use all the money and nothing happens. Uh, that's moderately common in these projects. So it's well, they they get the money, but most of the time they spend it. Yeah, like no. they don't get a million dollars and just leave the country. No. They get a million dollars, and you know they try to make some widgets so it goes the fees go to the manufacturing base. And it's, eh. So so the the real thing is that even even if you have a really amazing project, and you know some of these are really cool, technically interesting, um, or really innovative ideas. If you don't take the time with, to think about the, the project management aspect, it's almost guaranteed to fail. And uh, you notice I have this sum form here. And why I say that specifically is it doesn't mean you absolutely need this you know, very detailed, specific project plan that follows some international guidelines. Um, what it means is you have to have the basic principles we'll talk about a little bit about today. And these principles are really all about breaking down your problem um, thinking of what could go wrong, what sort of risks you'll face, how you might mitigate those risks. If you, obviously, if you have a very large project, you'll want this to be a very formalized approach, um, and it's going to pay off. You're going to be able to spend the time and the money to do it. Uh, for very simple projects, you know, if you're doing a hobby project or you're organizing a charity event, you're not going to write a 50-page project management plan and have very formal uh, outlook on it. But you still want to think about all of these aspects. So that's why I say some form in the caveat here, that it's not necessarily going to fail uh, if you don't do you know, a very formal approach, but you should still think about all these aspects. All right, any questions up to this point before I move on, I guess I should ask? All right. Um, so the very basic thing in Project Management 101 that we'll be sort of using is we use something called a work breakdown structure, so this WBS, you'll see it um, written as. And all this is doing is it's breaking down, so the first thing we're going to do is break down a larger task, you know, build a robot. Like what the heck does that encounter, who knows, uh, into very manageable chunks. These are the deliverables. And it's not a schedule, so this is... This is not telling you how you're going to do something or specifically what you're going to do. All we're going to say is we're going to take the task and break it down into things we need to do. So this is why it says deliverables here, like, you know, make the system that turns the motors on and off or fret forward or backwards or adjust the speed of them. So that's a deliverable. Or make the system that senses the, um, you know, if there's a wall in front of you, there's a deliverable. Uh, it's not saying how you're going to do it, just what the end result is going to be. And basically we're going to do this in a recursive fashion. So we're going to say, okay, well, I'm going to make a system to detect the wall. But that might not be enough detail for you to really estimate the time because you have no idea. Can I do that in a day? Does that take a week? Does that take longer if you don't have experience? 
Um, so you might take that task and further subdivide it. And I'll give you an example of that after, but it might be, okay, well, first we'll investigate what sensors there are. And our deliverable is just a little, you know, some notes to ourselves about what type of sensors we could use, what we have access to. Um, the next deliverable might be to design, pick one of those sensors and design a circuit around it. And the next deliverable is to, you know, test that system and tune it for the wall that we're, we have to detect with the robot. Um, so that's sort of how we do this recursive level. And each of those tasks is more reasonable. So you could say, well, researching those sensors, maybe that takes me four hours to look up each one, maybe play with it a tiny bit. Um, because you can sort of envision in your head what you're physically going to be doing for that task. So once we have enough of these that we could estimate the time for each one, uh, we can then turn it into a schedule. So this is where we do have to estimate or determine the time for each of these lower level tasks. Um, and at this point, we just chain the tasks together. So some of the stuff you're going to say, you know, I can only do task B after task A is done. In this case, you have to wait until you've designed the circuit for uh, using the sensor before you can <laughs> test the sensor. And it's, if you want to use a graph for this last step, this is the sort of the Gantt chart that gets pulled out in a lot of situations. And have people used this out of interest in other, I don't know of other projects? So you're familiar with them. Um, for our class, I won't explicitly require, require you to use them. I highly recommend it, and I'll show you a simple example of making one. Uh, they're really good at showing the interconnections, but what I really want to stress is that it's the process of doing this that's more critical. So. If you're able to communicate what you're going to do just by writing you know, step one, step two, step three, and I'll show you a structure for doing that um, and how they're chained together, that's fine for me because it's more critical that you sort of have thought about what are the tasks, what are the tasks that depend on each other than the fact that you have you know, a bunch of horizontal lines with little arrows connecting them. Um, so it's really the, the process of doing this that's useful and the Gantt chart's a great way to communicate it quickly, but not what I want you to get out of this. So you might say like, okay, I re I'm a really organized guy, I'm gonna go on a hike and I'm gonna make a little graph for this. And the work breakdown structure, the highest level thing, we give, we give this notation so the 0, 0.0 is our top level thing. So I say, well, I'm gonna go on a hike. Uh, what's involved in going on a hike? Uh, very basically, I'd say, well, I've got a schedule or plan or something like that, figure out where I want to go. Uh, I've got to do the hike, and I've got to finish the hike. So, you know, really basic hike. Uh, important to have a formal plan before you do this, of course. So, I can then break down each task. So, I'm going to call my friend Carl, and I'm going to confirm when he's free. I need a map, maybe, for the trail I'm going on. Uh, so print and buy maps. You could pack to go on the hike. And this is sort of all the scheduling planning. I can do that ahead of time, that's all done. Executing the hike, I'm gonna drive to the location, I'm gonna hike, and I'm gonna drive home. You know, and then finishing the hike, I'm gonna shower, maybe wash my clothing if I feel like it, maybe not, uh, and call my mom so she knows I'm not dead. So these are all the tasks that I'm going to put in going on a hike. Um, so now I can, you know, these are all really very well-defined tasks. I can estimate the time extremely well. Uh, and before I do that, I'm actually going to assign who's doing them. In this case, there's two people involved. So there's me and there's Carol. And I can say, well, I'm going to call Carol and I'm going to offload on him. I'm going to say, hey, can you buy these maps? I'm, you know, I'm too cheap to do that. So I put his name there in my plan. Uh, and because I'm cheap, I'm also not driving. Carol's driving. And I'm not going to give him money for gas. And then we're going to go on a nice hike. And then Carol's going to drive home. And then I do the rest of it. So now we've assigned the tasks. Uh, the reason we do this first is, you know, it might depend how fast, uh, how, many, how many people you have assigned to them. If this was a larger software project, some of this might be building a test spec. And it might depend if you have one guy on it or ten guys on it, how long that's going to take. Uh, normally, for sort of real project management, all of these subtasks, you try to have them last less than 80 hours. Um, 
So most of the examples I'm showing are going to be very, very short tasks, you know, like less than an hour. Normally, you, wouldn't, you would try to have tasks that take at least, at least sort of half a day to a day up to about a week to complete a week or maybe two weeks, um, depending on how many people are involved in the project. So you don't want it to be so fine-grained that it's, you know, every 15 minutes you're calling someone saying, hey, how's task 1.2.3.4.5 coming? Did you finish that yet? Um, but you also don't want to get completely off the rails with, uh, you know, like four-month tasks, and no one really knows where it's going. So now I'm going to add the time estimates. Uh, you know, it takes me 15 minutes to call Carl. He's going to buy the maps. Um, I put half an hour there. Packing, say an hour. Uh, we can drive to the location. Maybe it's an hour away. Uh, the hike itself, again, we have a pretty good estimate if we know the area. It's about 3.5 hours, go home, uh, shower, you know, with, with uh, getting the shower ready and everything, I say half an hour. Um, washing the clothing, if I know how long my washing machine takes, one and a half hour. And I'm going to have an hour long call to tell my mom I'm not dead. So that's the time estimates. Uh, this still isn't a schedule. It hasn't told us, you know, how long will this take front to back? And this is where the Gantt chart comes in handy. So this is showing you, I've sort of planned throughout the day. Um, so these are times within the day. I've done a much more fine grain approach. And the key is that some of this stuff happens in parallel. So I'm gonna call Carol to check when he's free up here. Um, after I call him, I can go pack uh, in blue while he buys the map. At this point, we have a delay until the next thing. And this is the driving to location. Um, and these are all interconnected. So if any of these were delayed, it's going to delay the whole you know, project, we could say. Because if the drive to the hike takes longer, um, it's going to delay when we start hiking. We're still going to hike for the same amount of time. It's going to take us as long to get home. Um, so all the times are going to shift forward. We also see towards the end here, for example, uh, I can put my clothes in the washing machine at the same time as I'm showering, um, and maybe I wait till, wait till the clothes are done before I call my mom. But I could have also just connected this up here. Um, so I could have said after I shower, I call my mom, and the clothes are still in the washing machine. I don't care. That's just happening. So this is sort of a very basic Gantt chart. And you can see that the useful thing is that it makes it easier to figure out what can't we screw up, basically. What's the critical path, as it's called? Um, so the critical path in this case is all going through here uh, because any delay there is going to delay, delay the whole project. Um, so if you know if the hike takes longer, the drive there or the drive back takes longer, it's going to delay the time of those other tasks and ultimately the time of the final project. Um, of course, if you know the shower, if I slip and fall in the shower and that takes longer because then I've got to get up and call the ambulance and all this stuff, that's also going to delay my completion of the project. Um, so that's all part of the critical path. For your robot, you're, you know, you'll want to think about what are some things, what are some sort of dates that I really need to hit. So you need to have a finished robot by the competition day that works. But you're going to want to have something that mostly works, you know, well before that, so you can start tuning it. Um, and that's all part of this, this scheduling and critical path stuff. So for making a Gantt chart, there's two options. One is this open proj. So on the, uh, the BB Learn, there's a link to it. I was just told, actually, the link I'll show you, and I'll fix this. Um, so th I think apparently the link isn't super obvious where you download it. Um, so if you just hit download, I don't think that works because you have to hit, it doesn't give you a file that you can install on Windows. You have to hit the files button, open Proj binaries, the latest version, which was from 2008, 1.4. Uh, the other option too, if you have access to a Microsoft project, which sometimes you can get access to these things as students uh, is really good. But you can also use Excel for making that work breakdown structure or Word or anything. I think we can all get a project. You can get project? Uh, through the, through the Spark or whatever. 
Okay, okay, that'd be good if so, because I might show that instead. Um, yeah, and then you have to hit this dot MSI. So this is the Windows installer, which it doesn't say anywhere, of course. But but yeah, if you can get Project, then I'll, I may do a separate class on that quickly. Um, project is sort of much nicer than Open Proj. But as I also mentioned, uh, I'm more interested in ensuring that you go through this process than that you specifically do it uh, with, you know, to generate, do it with a specific software or making this specific output. The other option is um, there's some online services. So the previous one, I use this like Tom's Planet. There's a whole bunch of them if you Google. I don't actually guarantee you any of them are better than others, um, but it's a pretty easy way if you don't want to install and it tries to spam you a bit with some stuff. Uh, but you can see it has the same idea. So we can, there's these different sort of higher level tasks and we can add subtasks, we can define how long they run for, assign them to people, um, adjust around, uh, adjust around you know, the length of them, stuff like that. It's not quite as powerful in linking the tasks together uh, that I found anyway, but it does give you the same idea and you can just make a, this was the demo one, um, and you can just make a free account with an email and you can just use an email. I don't even think it checks it. Just see. Oh, someone already did that. <laughs> uh, no. okay. Not valid. Okay. Huh? Let's try. All right, there we go. Thank you for signing up. You are welcome. And it just opened, so you don't actually need to. Uh, Oh, no. <laughs> I don't know what my email is. Yeah. Uh, when I did this before, it doesn't actually test, so I think that should work. Great. Okay, there you go. So, uh, you know, I don't, you don't want to be spammed a whole bunch. There you go. Um, yeah, so, and you can use this. You probably want to use an email address you can remember, so, because it'll save it online. Uh, and stuff like that. So if I go, you know, design robot motor controller. And then you can say, um, you know, research designs. Um, and you can assign it a amount of time and stuff like that. So I just right click. It's one of those things that tells you is there's this right click thing so we can insert a period. Um, and say, you know, we're going to do that for two days. And this is good because, again, you can assign it to different people and you can easily do, uh, if you want to do two things at once. So if at the same point, you're researching the design. Um, you might be, you know, looking at your motor controller at the same time as you're looking at sensors. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of value in having this nice graphical view and you can sort of look at what is today, what should have I already done. Um, but again, that's just one of many options for doing this this type of thing. Right. Uh, so this, here's a Gantt chart created with, I don't know if this was OpenFrage or a different software, um, but you can see again the, the critical path uh, is the one where any delay would end up delaying your whole project. Um, so this, there's a, this path in red. Uh, you can see here basically Everything is back to back, so red, 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 red. Any delay here is going to delay when the final project is done. In blue, uh, there's you know a bunch of room because after the final blue task is over here, uh, there's all this sort of dead space where if any of the blue tasks expand, you know if this task ends up taking longer, it's it's not the critical path. It doesn't really matter. It's going to push the date up a little. You know as long as it doesn't expand too far, uh, it's not going to delay your project. If the tasks in red expand, they will delay your project. So that's sort of what makes it the critical path. Um, so the most important thing is that if you've never done scheduling or it's a project you've never done before, it's probably going to be like horribly, horribly wrong. Uh, again, it's really important to keep an eye on how your schedule is doing and just learn from that and say, oh, I thought it would take me a day to do this research. It takes me a week. For the future, 
uh, I should remember that just if someone asked me to do, you know, hey, how long is it going to take you to finish this uh, circuit board layout? Uh, and you should think, oh, last time I said that would only take six hours, but it took 20, so that's what I should tell them. Uh, of course, the, the, what most people do is they just pad, they just say, I'll just multiply by two all my careful estimates. Um, you don't want to do that too much because it also doesn't really teach you where your errors were in your scheduling and figuring that out is more useful than just figuring out how to randomly add 20 hours to every estimate you give. Um, and again, scheduling will be a big part of the plan and we'll talk, talk a lot about that. There's going to be some progress reports that there'll be uh, more details on that as they come up. Part of that is looking at you know, what's your schedule? What did you think your schedule was? How are you progressing against it? Uh, and for the final report, that'll be a major part in the presentation is how closely did your uh, planned, you know, the schedule you created match what you ended up with? Sort of even, and again, it's not about how, how well you did in terms of scheduling, it's what you learned by it or, um, or where you realized the errors were. So I'm not, you're not gonna lose marks just by saying, oh, my original schedule and my final mat were way off. Uh, that's fine. If they're way off, they probably will be. All right, so questions before I go into the risk management part on the scheduling stuff? No? OK. Um, so risks are basically what will screw up your project most of the time. And risk management is how we consider these risks, how we try to mitigate them. So some really common risks, or you know, errors, however you want to call them, are the time and cost estimates are incorrect. Um, you know, you see this all the time, especially if you in the news and stuff like that. So the the ferry from Yarmouth had some issues with many things here. Uh, budget changes, of course, will have are another risk, so you, your project is based on some budget and the budget changes. Um, and this, the budget change could be, you know, well, we, we started a project, uh, it's gonna be a multi-million dollar project, we've start, started to do some of the work, and it was based on the idea that the government was really supportive of this research, they had some great programs we were going to uh, tie into, and then the government changes and they cut all that funding. So the budget change can be very high level and still affect your project drastically. It's not just the case of, you know, your boss specifically said, oh, you have $10,000 less. Um, change of scope is another big one. So your project had a, a very, you know, originally was defined for some small task, and then that just gets, keeps getting expanded because people keep piling more into it. Uh, legal issues will also, you'll run into, so this is where you know, you need some sort of special certification. You're going to sell your product and it turns out, oh, actually, uh, we needed, and I'll talk some about the certifications. If it's a medical product, for example, it takes a very long time, uh, years to get some of the certifications, costs several hundred thousand dollars. And if your product changes, some of them can be invalidated completely and you have to restart the process. Um, so you might have, you know, a change of scope might have huge legal issue implica implications because you had approval for this one product, you know, say a pacemaker or something, and then you decide to add Bluetooth for it, to it for some reason. Um, and then all of a sudden, all your certification's invalid, so you need to redo that. Uh, and then, you know, you can check your pacemaker from your phone, stuff like that. I don't know why you would, but say you wanted to. The other big one is supplier issues. So, when you're doing this budget, you're gonna to go to your suppliers and say, you know, I need 100,000 100, of these parts, uh, these resistors, capacitors, ICs, whatever. Um, and they'll give you an idea on the lead time, which is how long it takes to get it. So lead time is just how long. Um, and at the time, they might say, oh yeah, you know, the, we have 500,000 of those in stock, no problem at all. Uh, if that stock wasn't reserved, someone might buy it all uh, out from under you, and then all of a sudden they say, oh, actually, we're all out now. You know, in a month when you go to order it, they're all out, and it now takes several months to get it more in, because the manufacturer is literally making it now. It just doesn't exist in the world. Um, and in that case, you'd have nothing to do but wait, or you might have to try to go to other suppliers that might not be as reliable. 
Uh, so supplier issues can also be a really big source of problems. So a lot of these, there's different ways to mitigate them. Um, but in general, what we'll want to do is we'll want to go through, uh, so identifying the risks. So in the previous slide, this was just some common risks that you might run into. Uh, your project might have other ones. Um, analyzing the risks. So here is where we look at what would be the effect of the uh, risk in terms of on our project, on our schedule, on our budget. Um, you know, what, and what is the likelihood? So those are the real two things you're going to need. So you could say there's a risk, you know, that our building catches fire, our development office catches fire. Um, that's a risk, and it would mean all of our work is destroyed. Obviously, something like that mitigating would be backup, but at this point, all we're going to consider is what is the effect of the risk, and it would be catastrophic, and how likely is it, and not very likely. We're going to use this with a little bit of a matrix um, to prioritize the risks. So... The matrix we use is this sort of consequence and likelihood matrix. Uh, so you can see on this axis, it's you know how bad is it for our project. A higher consequence number means very bad things happen. A low is like, yeah, whatever. We're not that worried. And how likely is it? Um, so obviously things that are very likely and going to destroy the project have this uh, very high rating here. So a very high priority. And things that, you know, would still destroy the project, but are very unlikely, so this might be the fire, our office catching fire, uh, are quite a bit further down. So we still want to deal with them. We still have this moderate uh, threshold, because if they happen, it's pretty unlikely they'll happen, but if they happen, it would be absolutely catastrophic. Um, whereas risks that are very low consequence, you know, like, our developer is sick for two days. That's not ideal, but it's only two days. It's pretty likely, you know, this project maybe is running over the winter and lots of people get sick. So that would be a, a very low, you know, low consequence, but high likelihood type risk. So based on those two, um, we can then prioritize the risks. So we'll just sort of see, we have a finite amount of money, people, effort to expand, uh, what's the ones we should really focus on? Uh, and after that, the rest of them are simply oops, uh, planning the response. So should the risk occur, what are we going to do? Or uh, possibly, what are we going to do to mitigate that? We may have to be proactive in the response. So as an example, oops, just went to the front. Come on. So as an example, the, where I gave you the example of the supplier, um, so the parts on back order now with 14 week lead time, what we could say is for every part in our design, we'll make sure we have a second supplier that also has it in stock. Uh, and we may also go out of our way to order this stock much earlier than we need it or get some sort of you know, guarantee that they're going to hold it for us. Um, if we have the, uh, the change of scope, you know, we might have a, a management uh, mitigation. We're first going to ensure it's very well defined. Um, as another example, we might uh, have, you know, some backups. If someone says we need to add feature Y to it, we've already done a bit of research into how much that's going to cost. So we can right away say, if you want to add that feature, it will cost you $2 million more dollars. <laughs> Um, oops. So, and that sort of the what I just talked about can also run a little bit off the rails. So this planning the risk response, um, where we sort of have you know what's gonna what will happen, what will be the cost to us if this you know whatever the risk is happens. Um, what's the cost of fixing it? So in the out of scope example, what's the cost of adding this to our project? So this can go a bit off the rails. As a classic example of this, uh, Ford 
this is more commonly known as with the Ford Pinto, but it was actually some other cars as well. Um, Ford had some cars that were very likely, if they were rear-ended, the fuel tank would, is extremely likely to leak and catch fire in like 20% of cases. And so this, this is a memo from Ford. It was never really proven how fair they used it, but some engineer did this assessment. And uh, they said, well, you know, 180 people, if we fix this problem, uh, 180 people will not be burned to death. Uh, 180 people would not get serious burn injuries, and there'd be about 2,000 cars that we'd save. Uh, and they figured out, well, what's the cost that we would pay out for, you know, if this happens, because it's our fault. And it works out to about $50 million is the cost of, you know, these people, all these people dying and getting burned. That's how much it's going to cost us in lawsuits. Uh, by comparison, to fix the problem, it's costing $11 for every car. So this was, uh, I believe, adding some reinforcements. Um, but we're selling so many of these, it's going to cost us 130, whoops, $137 million to fix the issue. Uh, and they said, well, the benefit to us is only $50 million, but it would cost us $137 million. Therefore, the best course of action is to not fix the cars, because that's cheaper, right? $50 million costs less than $137 million. And strictly by this sort of risk management cost benefit, true. Uh, obviously, this had a lot of fallout for them, because people don't really like this for good reason. Um, and again, this is, this is why things aren't always, you know, there's this nice matrix here. But you also do require a little bit of sanity when you're applying all this stuff. Uh, in that where things might fall might be different, or in some cases like you know, this, you might say, well, even though the cost technically you know, is not so high, the problem is we're killing people in one case, so it's still worth it to us to fix the, the underlying problem. Um, so one of the other sort of risks that fell into this legal issues column is dealing with patents. And I guess before I move on, were there questions on that section, the risk, the risk management? It sort of moves on to patents now. Um, so patents are a way that can give you some legal protection against uh, people stealing your idea. This is what's commonly thought of. Uh, they're also in the news a lot for, you know, people, oh, someone got a crazy patent for pushing a guy on a swing or something like that. Uh, which there is a patent on, I believe. There's, I can look, I'll pull that up after. Uh, so I just want to give you a basic overview of how patents work. If you're interested in them or in the future you have some great idea, you might want a patent. I have a disclaimer that this is not legal advice. I'm not a lawyer. Um, just so you're clear, you should, if you do, are interested in a patent, you should talk to a lawyer. But all a patent does is it prevents someone else from selling a device which infringes on your claim. So it's not a license to sell a device. It's a license to say, you know, I've created a pen and I've patented the pen. Um, no one else can sell the pen. But it doesn't mean someone else could have previously patented the two. And by selling the pen, I am infringing on the two patent. So there's this whole uh, sort of legal framework. It's only uh, enforced in whatever geographic area it was issued in. Uh, so if I have a US patent, it only stops someone from selling the pen in the US. It doesn't stop them from selling it in Canada, the UK, EU, China, wherever else it might be. And a patent, and if you start to look through patents, you'll see this. It's basically a legal proceeding. I'm claiming, as the person that's uh, applying, that you know, the pen is my own idea. And the patent office is trying to reach a verdict of is that true or not. Um, and what I mean by sort of standard legal procedure here is that they're going to look at what's called prior art, which is all the previously published information in the area, as well as how other similar patents uh, were issued. So this is part of the reason it becomes so expensive and complex to get a patent is 
it's not just a document saying what I invented. It's really a legal proceeding, and the patent office has to look back at all the precedent in previous uh, patents that were issued or lawsuits around patents to determine if they should issue it. And when I apply, I am going to make all these claims, you know, I am amazing and invented the pen. And it's going to be examined in the patent application. So the patent application is what I send in. And the key thing um, is that the patent application is absolutely not a patent. So these, this is just something I'm claiming. That's all it means. And a patent application just means I have $400. That's literally the only thing it means. That's the cost of applying for a patent um, for the patent office to process it and publish it. If you want it to be enforceable, that is, you've had sort of a lawyer look over it, uh, you're talking $5,000 minimum, probably closer to $10,000 or so by the time it's um, issued, if it's issued. To defend a patent, so once it's issued, someone can come along and say, actually, that's crazy. You know, I invented the pen. Ten years ago, I was making patents. Uh, the resulting lawsuit typically will cost at least $50,000, uh, easily more than that. After that point, the patent has a lot more value because it's proved that, hey, someone tried to sue him and they lost, or maybe your patent's overturned, in which case it's effectively useless. Um, if you want to look at a patent, so if you're curious, you know, hey, what did this guy claim to invent? Uh, you have to realize there's basically two sections of interest. So there's the claims and there's absolutely everything else. So the claims are what is really the innovative material. Um, everything else helps you define how the patents work and they can limit the scope of the claims, but that's really what you need to look at because you see people, you know, they, they read a patent and says, like, oh, it's crazy, this patent talks about generic software stuff. Um, unless it's in the claims, it basically doesn't matter. And any of the prior art, so if you say, hey, you, you're claiming you invented the pen, I did though, um, all of that prior art must read specifically on those claims. And interpreting these uh, claims is insane, basically. If you start looking at uh, some of the lawsuits around it, you know, how critical the locations of commas or semicolons or the phrasing of what seems like common words completely changes the meanings. So let's look at an example. Uh, so I just picked a random patent. So you can use like Google, or that should be patents.google.ca, not scholar. I'll change the slides when I upload them. Uh, but if we look at Google Patents, uh, if I search for like software, um, so the differences are, I'm just gonna click on one. So if I look at the first result for software, we can see it's in fact just an application. So this was never an issued patent. Uh, it looks almost the same. And you'll see lots of websites that, you know, that have like, oh, look at this crazy patent that Apple just got, when really it's a patent application. So it could mean nothing. Um, you know, it could mean they're working on something, but it's not necessarily that it's innovative. So uh, the patent itself, if you look at the PDF, so there's a number of figures showing different things, um, but somewhere way at the bottom is the claims. Go way down. Okay, so once you see these numbers, that's the claim. So what is claimed? Um, so this is the only thing that whatever this patent is about, I don't even know offhand, uh, that's what they're claiming is unique. So we can go back to Google because that's a little easier to read. Um, so it's these claims that are what they think is the unique feature. So what is claimed? Uh, so this software storage system um, and it's basically everything in this number one claim is one thing. So whatever they're saying they invented in there, uh, some sort of prior art would have to basically read on every aspect of that. So they say it, um, you know, what do they say? Online storage management application on the host network, which allows, so that you always see this polarity, which just means a bunch of users to store and manage their software applications. Um, 
So if someone else had a patent and it wasn't done online, well, that would, uh, wouldn't count against this because this one is now online. Um, so this is why it's very, very tricky to, to see. And if you want to look at the complexity of a patent, I'll get another one. So here's, so here's one that was assigned to uh, HP. I don't know, some uh, software watchdog timer. So this is a grant, which means that it was given to them. So the, the patent office allowed it. Um, and I can take this public application number here. So I have an application number. And I can go to a website that I mentioned here. Um, so the United States Patent and Trademark Office has a website. And you can see publicly uh, all the information about the, the patent proceedings. So if you're interested in it, it's sort of a uh, cool thing. Because let's look at that. So they make you solve these puzzles. Um, and it says, how do you want to search? So application number, I'm just going to put in the copy from Google. Um, and so this is just information on the patent. So actually, in this case, it says the patent expired because they didn't pay their fees. So presumably HP doesn't want it anymore. Um, and so we can see, so this is sort of the back and forth between the patent office and the lawyers that were applying on behalf of the inventor. Are there still now? Pardon? Are there still now? Possibly, yeah. I think they can still pay it again. And I don't know exactly how, how long. So what you see is that uh, why it's so expensive to get a patent is you can see these rejections. Um, Non-final rejection, non-final rejection, final rejection. So what's happened is the, the U.S. Patent Office has actually come back a whole bunch of times and said this patent is not, uh, you know, it's not unique. There's some problems with it. Um, and the other lawyers just argue that it is unique or they make small adjustments to it. Um, so we can see, for example, let's look at two of these. You know, and every time you're doing this, you're paying your lawyer whatever it is, like several hundred dollars an hour minimum um, for their time to do this. Oops. Try it again. Oh, so I don't know why that's not working, but, um, but you can look up this if you're sort of interested in. Let's try the online. Um, so this was the patent office sending them back something saying that the patent was invalid. So it says uh, these claims are rejected. So I don't know what they were claiming specifically. Let's look. Um, and you can basically see the language, you know, claims 1 to 24 are rejected under. This is, in this case, we're in the U.S., and this is the specific section of the US, um, the patent code or whatever the, the law is called. And they're saying that basically in view of this other patent combined with some other patent, someone else has predicted you might do this. Um, and you see all the various details of the patent office arguing them. And the lawyers will, can, will come back and say, oh, well, actually, you know, these other two patents you're citing didn't fully <laughs> declare what we want. So it, it's not straightforward to do this. And this is part of the reason patents are so expensive. Um, and let's see what they, hire. pardon? This is why you hire a lawyer. Yeah, this is why you hire a lawyer. Because if you do this wrong, you can also get a patent that someone can later say like, oh, actually, we can easily circumvent. Um, so it's sort of interesting, as I say, if you're interested in it. And, yeah, so then they come back with some adjusted claims and some arguments. Um, anyway, so that's sort of what's involved in the patent system. Yeah, so in this case, for example, this was a different one I pulled out. Uh,
the person who wrote this, I don't know if they were a lawyer or not, because this was the entirety of the rejection, is that in, in claim one, the user's digital devices, uh, the does not clearly define who the users are, so they just reject it entirely. And then you've got to fix that, come back, pay more money. All right, the other thing you'll see is uh, EMC, electromagnetic compatibility, and safety testing. So if you look on the label of anything, this was from a power <laughs> supply for a netbook, or I don't know which one this was. Um, netbook, you see all these different things. So there's like a, uh, you know, this is a safety, the CUL listed. Uh, oh, yeah. So the only, well the difference is basically, it comes back to, sorry, yeah, that's a good question, um, that it's only enforceable in the geographic area that it's issued in. Uh, so it will depend a lot. You, people will go for US patents because for a lot of products, uh, when I say enforceable, this means if I have a US patent on something, I can stop anyone in the US from selling my product. Um, you know, it doesn't matter if it's invented elsewhere, someone can't import that to the US and sell it. So the US is a pretty big market, and if, it, if it's something like a computer style thing, that might be where I want a patent solely for that reason. Um, so if, like, say, say I'm in some American company, and a guy in like, Guatemala invents something, and he patents it in Guatemala, and I'm like, oh hey, I can make money in America, I'm gonna take your patent, and I get a patent in the United States. Uh, so theoretically, no, because the U.S. Patent Office would search. If, if it was dis disclosed anywhere in the world, it stops you from patenting it. So if it, even if it's published in an academic paper, I can't take that idea and say I'm going to patent it. Theoretically, uh, the reality is that the U.S. Patent Office, you know, it's a government thing. They they don't get much. They don't get a lot of funding, so they have limited amounts of funds, limited amounts of time to search when someone submits a patent application. The applicant, if it's someone you know like HP or Google, they can put millions of dollars into one, getting one patent, so they can afford to keep, you know, arguing different ways. Um, and they may not, in fact, search. They might not be able to see any other material. So I don't know where I say this. Okay, no, I don't say. But um, they might not have the ability to find where that original publication was. So if it's this highly technical idea, someone's rewritten it, rewritten it. Um, you know, in different language, they've got to now try to figure out, did someone publish this somewhere else, describe it differently, um, it just, they might not find that. It might have been published in a journal, they don't use the correct search words. All of the, the patents, the people that are doing this are obviously very highly trained, but they still, <laughs> they have limited time and money to spend on each one. Okay. So theoretically, no, if you had a patent somewhere, that's good enough to stop someone else from patenting it. Um, but you could no longer, there's all these time limits as well, so if I had a U.S. patent, uh, I can't wait three years and then get a European patent. Because when I apply for the European patent, they'll say, no, that was already patented. That was disclosed a year ago. Uh, so you kind of would have to do it all at once. There is some overlaps in time. There's some, uh, like in the U.S., you have a year from when you disclose it before you have to have the patent application filed. Some places don't have that, so some places, as soon as you disclose it, you're done. So if I, if I told you all about this great idea I had, um, in certain countries I could no longer patent it because I publicly disclosed it to you. Uh, and then there's rules about what's public and what's not public. So that's also, you know, there's always rules about everything. But uh, that's very basically why it is. Uh, there is another thing called a worldwide patent, which basically takes your patent and just puts it out to various offices. So all of EU, you could be covered in the US, you can be covered. Um, it, it, a number of countries just have a treaty, so that costs even more, as you might imagine. And then each country can individually, um, pardon? Say no. And then I yeah, so that's the thing. So it's, it, or we'll individually examine it because it might be, there's also different standards for what constitutes innovative material. Um, yeah, so that's obviously even more expensive and stuff. The key is that it costs so much 
to defend a patent to $50,000 plus, uh, that a lot of people abuse that excessively. And this is where you run into like the patent trolls you all hear about, in that companies uh, have some patent that may or may not, may be completely invalid. You know, they, someone got a patent on something, um, the company now owns this patent and says, oh, I have a patent and I'm gonna sue you. But if you pay me $5,000, I won't sue you. So you sort of as a company say, well, to defend you, even though we're gonna win, it's gonna cost us $25,000. Right? Even though it's this clear-cut case, we're going to win. So we're just going to pay you because it's cheaper. <laughs> and that's, it's simply, it's guaranteed to be cheaper. Uh, so the only people that fight it are, there's some you know, people that will help fund fighting these patent trolls just because they want them to go away. Because it crushes innovation. Uh, because they'll purposely target you know, small-ish but innovative businesses that can't afford to defend. But they know that you're, you know, you'll just pay because you want to keep developing the technology. So it's a, it's a very difficult problem in this case. So any other questions on the patent stuff? That All right. Uh, so for the safety, yeah. So there's all these these labels, um, and again, like the the patents, getting some of these certifications can be expensive, depending. Um, so some of them, in particular, FCC, this is the U.S., um, what's known as electromagnetic compatibility testing, which tests two things. One, it's testing that uh, your device doesn't interfere. So if I have a cell phone, or cell phone's a bad example, the power supply on the table here, um, if you have a radio over there, this power supply shouldn't interfere with your radio. Um, so this is the interference testing. It also shouldn't matter if I have you know, my power supply here, uh, you're using the microwave across the room. The microwave is going to emit some radiation. It shouldn't cause the power supply to explode. That would not be good. Uh, so there's various, uh, these interference testings are basically checking, does your device generate interference and can it accept a reasonable amount? Um, so as an example, this was a project I was working on and the, you get a test report. So this red line here is whatever the limit is. Um, so for different frequencies, uh, this bottom axis is in megahertz. Um, for different frequencies, your device can just emit certain amounts of power in these different bands, and you basically have to make sure your device is below the limit. So I think in this case, this product literally just passed. You can see like there's one spike right, right below the limit, but technically that passes. And you can look this up. Uh, two if you want. So I have on my cell phone, and I'll see if this works. I pulled the back cover off, and any device that transmits, so this would be cell phones, a little, you know, thermom Nest thermometer or stuff like that, has this uh, FCC ID, and the same thing for Industry Canada. FCC is the US. Uh, it's just larger, but anything sold in Canada would also need Industry Canada as certification. So I can put in this number on the back here. And we'll see if it works. I didn't actually try this. So there's just a code. Oh, code is invalid. Three. They started issuing longer ones occasionally. Because they ch changed the rules how the, uh, the codes were issued. Okay, so I don't know, I probably misread this, but uh, if you enter a, let's see, oh wait, no, here we go. I was putting the Industry Canada code in. Okay, there we go. Uh, so we get the, the three, the report for this particular device. Um, and you can see it's Motorola Mobility LLC. Um, and there's various things, so they've done testing uh, what you can see here is there's various frequency bands. So this is obviously this is a cell phone. It has support for all sorts of different frequencies. Um, and if we click on, I'll just pick one detail. And it's loading. Um, and so these are just the various test reports. So let's take a look. 
And this will also show you what their test setup was. It should have a photo, technically, of the, uh, the test, so it's kind of interesting. And we can also look at... Um, so it's just this huge report. You know, they did some testing somewhere in the States. This one was done. Um, and so it tells you where the test lab is, blah, blah, blah. And then it'll have, I don't know what these tests, specific tests are for, but you know, it has some of the frequency band showing um, whatever rules they have to follow for their particular device. And somewhere it should have a photo towards the end. So this might just be frequencies. Normally there's also a photo showing um, the test. So in this case, they just have a diagram. Uh, so there's a churn table, the phone was put on, and it turns around, and the receive antenna is up at the top. Um, and there'll be a bunch of stuff, user manuals. So there's photos uh, as part of it. So you can see photos of, this is the internals of my phone here. Um, so as part of the test report, the FCC ID is basically only <laughs> valid for this model. In theory, someone could come back and check, you know, what if they sneakily changed the circuit board uh, and didn't tell the FCC and it changed the emissions requirements and it, it should no longer pass. So they sort of have these photos to help you see it. So it's also a good way if you ever need to look up uh, photos of a phone confidential, uh, temporary. Yeah. yeah, so it expired. And then the SAR, so this is a specific absorption something, whatever the R stands for. So this is basically testing, um, there should be a photo somewhere. Uh, this is testing how much power goes into your body when you're using it. So left touch position, I guess, is like that. Uh, and it's checking how much, uh, yeah, his SAR value, so it's checking how many watts of power per, in this case per kilo it's using, uh, is absorbed by your body. So there's all these limits to what, you know, is safe, are they claiming is safe? Um, so yeah, that's part of the, the FCC, FCC requirements. The other thing you'll have is um, very specialized systems will have even more expensive and additional testing. Uh, stuff like aviation, mining, any of these safety critical are going to have even uh, have different tests that may be more specific. So as an example for mining, uh, there's something called a spark test. Uh, or th really this is for explosive environments, so mines are frequently that. But you basically want to make sure nothing you do will generate a spark that could cause uh, you know, gases to be ignited. So what we have here, this is part of the test, there's a little chamber at the top, and the chamber is actually filled with, um, I think there's a little chamber within that, that's the safety shield, uh, some sort of explosive gas mixture. So whatever the gas they're using, be, be it they're, they want to test hydrogen or some percentage of something else. Um, and wherever the device under test is, I don't know if it's this thing here, uh, it literally has some of the, the connectors for it are routed through this box and they simply connect and reconnect them and test if it generates a spark sufficient to ignite the gas. So it, it's a very hands-on testing method, but it just shows you that for very specific industries, there's going to be even more requirements that you'll have to, uh, you'll have to follow, um, which all falls back to our, you know, when we look at these risks, all of these legal issues. So these can really add a lot to a project or delay a project because the certifications you can't necessarily rush. You know, engineering, if you have an engineering problem, you can hire more engineers. The certification bodies do not care about your money. They are just going to take the amount of time they take. All right. So I think that's sort of all the material for today. Just check. Yeah, so in summary, um, the scheduling is a really critical part of the project planning. 
And I want to just stress that it doesn't have to be complex and it doesn't have to be overly formal. Um, you should, you need the structure to it. So I showed you the structure of writing the tasks and breaking them down, assigning time. Um, and you really should break it down until you can reliably estimate how long each task is going to take you. Uh, this is going to depend a lot on your project, a lot on your experience. You know, if you're not sure how long it's going to take you to assemble a board, uh, you might have to break it down further and say, well, let me, you know, do a little test of a small board or something like that. Um, at this point, so only after you've done that should you then consider how does the scheduling work. And the scheduling is really just stringing all those independent blocks together. Um, so, you know, task A and then task B. Um, or figuring out, hey, can I get someone else to do task B? It might be that these two tasks are not at all connected, uh, but you're, you're the only person that's doing both of them, so you, know, you can't do them in parallel because you only have so much time. It doesn't help. So that's, that's the part where you can deal with outsourcing. And um, there's many risks facing your project, so you can use that uh, matrix of the likelihood as well as the, what the effect will be on your project that we showed you, this guy here, uh, to help you understand what you should spend the most time uh, dealing with. So it's of high consequence. You, know, you almost always want to consider what you're going to do. Uh, if it's of low consequence, it may not be as critical. And in between here, this is where you have to deal with a combination of consequence and likelihood to figure out how much time, energy, or money you should invest into solving it. Um, and patent application is not a patent. That's the only other thing I like to stress because you see this all the time in the news where they do claim uh, you know, someone got a crazy patent when it was just the application. And with that, are there any questions on this stuff or the project? If not, I'll show you a swing patent and then we're done. Yeah, there we go. So yeah, this is a patent grant, so it was received. Method of swinging on a swing. Um, so, and again, you have to look at the claims. I claim a method of swinging on a swing, the method comprising suspending a seat for supporting a user between only two chains, positioning a user on the seat, and having the user pull alternately on one chain to induce movement of the user and having the swing toward one side and then on the other chain to induce movement to the other side. Repeating steps to create side to side swinging movement. Um, yeah, so this is an issued patent. So that gives you an idea. Probably no one's tried to fight it is the only re reason it remains issued. Uh, but again, the patent office is very limited in what they can search, and this sort of shows you that. You owe them royalties if you're making swing. <laughs> Officially. I don't think he's ever tried to enforce it, but there you go. What if instead of a swing like that, you get a tire swing? Is that a big deal? Yeah, so that, this would be where you have to read through. Yeah, so you'd have to read through a suspended. Yeah, suspending a seat. So the question would be one thing. You know, this is where the lawyer's coming. Is the tire a seat? or not, right? You might say, no, no, it's a, a seat has a very fixed horizontal you know, position. Um, and this is also where you would look through the specification because he's going to have a su summary. And if in his specification he says, I assume a tire is a seat as well, then it, you're hosed because he has called you, he has said, you know, I'm using the word seat, I define it as anything that you can sit upon. Um, if he in here says a seat is only a plank of wood, then you would be fine because he has explicitly said when I use the word seat, I assume you know we're talking a, a plank of wood. So uh, therefore, like in the future, the plastic and everything does not apply. The future of what? Like you know, if you said like in that time when he made it, only wood was used. Yes, if he called out, and that's where you have to be very careful because if you call out something that's state of the art. So if at the time you say a seat is a plank of wood, being reasonable because yeah. plastic doesn't exist, um, you're limited to that. If plastic comes along after, 
and the patent was still, you, you've written that out, you've eliminated that from yourself. So that's the other reason patent lawyers get paid so well, is um, that they, they have to think about that. They have to say, you know, as an engineer, we always like to describe stuff reasonably and, you know, in a way that people can understand. They need to describe it, a seat, as you know, a seat is a object upon which you can rest, or something like that, like there'd be more to it. But they have to remove all limitations from it, such that it's not, uh, it's not, you know, abused in the future. You can't write around it. All right.